welcoming you. May I request our chairman, Ikram Sagar, to welcome His Excellency, the President of Azad Jammu and Kashmir. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. It is indeed a privilege to have with us on this very solemn day for Pakistan and the President of Azad Jammu and Kashmir. I call it a solemn day because after following a, a policy of appeasement for 28 years after the Simla Agreement, when we changed the map to reflect a different Kashmir, we have now gone back to the original place where we consider Kashmir as our own territory. I will not delay the speech that the Azad Jammu and Kashmir President will give. Over to you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Kram Sehgal, also uh, members of the board, Karachi Council on Foreign Relations, and uh, other participants. Now, <clears throat> let me go straight to the point. As a matter of fact, I'm in, uh, as you would recall, that last year on August the 5th, India invaded and reoccupied the territory. It also beefed up the presence of its troops in the occupied territory uh, before August the 5th last year. The number of troops used to be 700,000, but then it was increased to 900,000 troops. And the sole purpose of uh, this force was to brutalize the people of Jammu and Kashmir. Immediately after attacking and laying siege to the entire territory of Jammu and Kashmir, um, the Indian um, occupation forces started a series of crackdowns uh, all over the occupied territory and they especially targeted young men. Another thing that they did uh, in the months of August and September last year was to incarcerate thousands of boys and children, as a matter of fact, I mean, their number was 13,000. And this was reported by Indian Federation of Women. Now this is a solid, uh, reliable and credible figure. And they were moved into concentration camps or jails and there they were indoctrinated and tortured. Um, so th this was another step that they took. Um, in October, uh, or, or to be precise, October the 31st and November, November the 1st last year, the uh, BJP RSS regime uh, divided the occupied territory into two parts and called them union territories. As you know, that uh, India calls as Federation Union, the Indian Union. So they declared them these Ladakh and Jammu and Kashmir as union territories or municipalities or um, uh, federal territories or federally administered territories. This was all done without the consent of the people because the assembly had been dissolved. The so-called assembly um, had been dissolved a year earlier and uh, other steps that they took were without the consent of the people. So um, Kashmir was turned into a colony and what Kashmiris were witnessing was foreign occupation, alien domination. They were under foreign occupation and alien domination. And India was now an occupation force, which it was before August the 1st, but now formally in accordance with international law, it's an occupation force there. Uh, <clears throat> then early this year, what they have done is that uh, they uh, introduced these uh, new domicile rules and they are meant to redesign and change the demographic composition of the occupied territory for all times to come. You know, the population of uh, the Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir is um, more or less uh, uh, 14 million, which would be um, one crore and uh, 40 lakhs uh, people uh, roughly. And they, tried to change this uh, composition um, by uh, drafting and implementing these laws, which are akin to the Nuremberg laws of, the, of 1935 of last year. These laws qualify uh, the uh, members of the armed forces who lived and served in uh, the occupied territory or uh, civil servants who have uh, uh, been associated with banks or statutory bodies or uh, other public sector entities. Um, all these people and their families have been given these domicile certificates. And uh, 
migrant workers who'd come from India or uh, the sanitation workers or the so-called West Pakistan refugees. So we're talking about uh, in one go, uh, half a million people in the last two months. Uh, and they have put this uh, kind of demographic change on a fast track because these outsiders who are flying from India or from abroad, uh, their applications are processed expeditiously by the officials and, an offici and if an official is not efficient enough, then he's fined uh, rupees 50,000 Indian rupees. So whereas on the other hand, these uh, uh, original inhabitants, native Kashmiris, especially Muslims, are being denied these, role, uh, these rights. You would recall that last year, India had uh, repealed Article 370 and also 35A. 35A recognized uh, four established rights of the Kashmiris, and they were permanent residence, acquisition of property, privileges in regard to education and livelihoods, or uh, uh, public sector jobs. All these rights are taken away from the Kashmiris, the original inhabitants, and now they are being given to these Hindus who are being imported from all over India. And bus loads of these uh, uh, new residents of Kashmir are being transported to the occupied territory. That is the resolution number 47 of 1948. This, is, this resolution was a very crucial resolution. It says, having considered the complaint of the government of India, that is, the government of India actually complained against Pakistan after the, or during the war with India. And what it was, India's concern, the dispute over the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And having heard the representative of India, and in support of that complaint, and the reply of Pakistan that the United Nations Security Council required the government of India to do numerous things. And it says, when the Indian forces have been reduced to the minimum strength in A, above, arrange the consultation with the commission for stationing the remaining forces to be carried out in accordance with the following principles, that the presence of troops should not afford any intimidation or appearance of intimidation to the inhabitants of the state. There, that, a small, that a small number as possible should be retained in the forward area that any reserve of troops which may be included in the total strength should be uh, located within their present base area. That is, the Indian Army was required to be moved out of Kashmir. And not only was it required to move out of Kashmir, but it was required to keep away from the locals, namely the Kashmiris. The RSS draws its inspiration and its organization from the fascist parties of Germany and Italy of the past century. The project they are embarked upon is to impose a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu state on all of India and to eliminate the legacy of Islam in the subcontinent. The intervention uh, and imposition uh, that was embarked upon on the 5th of August last year is the initial part of this plan. It is significant that the Indian government has described this plan as quote, the final solution, unquote, for Kashmir, unashamed of its uh, historical context in uh, the elimination of the Jews in Germany by the Nazis. You're talking about 8 million people who are under a virtual 
communication lockdown and of one of the most militarized regions in the world. It is also now being called the largest open air prison in the world. This is the ground reality of the valley today. And as much as India would like to paint it as a real estate issue or a bilateral issue between uh, India and Pakistan, the valley, the valley is much more. Since last year, the environments have changed and drastically changed and will continue to remain in flux. The opportunities today must be therefore exploited. India's neighbors are clearly expressing their dissatisfaction with Big Brother. Earlier, they could not say so. India-China relations are at their lowest. BJP's policies are harming the very structure of the state. Their media establishment relationship, the relationship of media and establishment, are beginning to fail in hiding the real face of India. So these are the opportunities we're developing there. The outcome or the, the consequences of what India has been doing in Indian occupied Kashmir and what it actually amounts to. And I think that it is uh, not just uh, in terms of violations of human rights or humanitarian uh, crises, but first and foremost, I think that their actions have led or le are creating conditions for ethnic cleansing because in addition to the revocation of Article 370, uh, they have also revoked the citizenship uh, rules and laws relating to Indian occupied Kashmir, whereby non-Kashmiris can acquire uh, in Kashmiri uh, citizenship or Kashmiri uh, rights to buy Kashmiri property. This is the most insidious means of trying to overtake or undermine the Muslim majority of occupied Kashmir. These actions are crimes against humanity or war crimes in accordance with the Fourth Geneva Convention or ICC statute or additional protocol one or several UN Security Council resolutions. In addition to that, I mean, these occupation forces have been killing young men every day in cordon and search and cordon and destroy operations. And uh, uh, they have been fetishizing women uh, and they have been harassing them. They have been using sexual violence against women as an instrument of war to silence uh, the Kashmiri activists and also to impose a collective punishment on the entire population. In addition to that, the Indian occupation authorities have been violating the ceasefire line or the line of control, and they have made life hell for the people of Azad Kashmir on their side as well. Now, <clears throat> uh, the Indian leaders, Narendra Modi, the defense minister, the interior minister, and Mohan Bhagwat, who is the president of Russia, so I'm Sevak Sang, they have also been threatening to take back Azad Kashmir militarily, attack Azad Kashmir, and take it back militarily. So, uh, I think that if you would recall that Rajnath Singh in the same breath had threatened China that it would take back Aksai Chin. Um, and that's why you had this uh, very sharp reaction from China. Uh, <clears throat> the Indian leaders, Narendra Modi and Rajnath Singh, I think that they've been threatening to disintegrate Pakistan. And uh, they have indicated that in this um, vicious, adventure, they might use nuclear weapons. So um, the situation has, has been dismal and dark in the occupied territory in the past year. And uh, what is happening now or what would happen in the coming months, or this uh, will have dire consequences because I'm talking to multiple audiences and I'm warning them that if we do not act now, uh, it would be too late to rectify the situation because if India changes the situation on the ground through democratic changes, there's little that we will be able to do because then the Muslim majority state, which wanted to join Pakistan, would be turned into a Hindu majority state. And this is possible because uh, by the end of this year, uh, they would have imported uh, 
four to five million people on a fast track basis. And if they do not accomplish this goal in one year, I'm sure that they would uh, be able to achieve it in two years time. So that's the only window that we have. Uh, let me also tell you about the international reaction. You know, the international reaction last year during the months of August, September and October was uh, very strong and there was a groundswell of support for the people of Jammu and Kashmir and a groundswell of opprobrium for India, India's uh, um, crimes against humanity and the brutalization of the people of Jammu and Kashmir had been called out by the leading international media, uh, television networks, uh, social media, also world parliaments. Many parliamentarians spoke up and spoke against Indian actions and uh, the international civil society was on our side. Of course, a handful of countries also supported us formally like China and Malaysia and Turkey and Iran and some West European countries, particularly Nordic countries. But uh, the most powerful governments in the West, particularly these veto-wielding powers, uh, they remain tongue-tied and tight-lipped on the issue of Jammu and Kashmir, and that has been a barrier for us. The security environment in South Asia is challenging and it is changing. The dominance of the region by a global power, the United States, and by a regional power, India, is diminishing. The United States has eroded its influence through mistaken foreign interventions in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. And India, in South Asia, is embarked on a project of hate which is eroding the stability of the subcontinent and of India itself. This would be something that the Americans did to the Native American. This is something that the Israeli governments are trying to do in occupied Palestine. And this is a playbook, the Israeli playbook is something that which Mr. Modi is implementing in uh, Indian occupied Kashmir. So the first thing is ethnic cleansing. The second is the level and manner in which the Indian army, 900,000 people which have, who have been in force in this occupied valley, particularly in the Jammu uh, region, uh, particularly in the Jhelum region, sorry, uh, ever since 1990 when the Kash Kashmiri uprising started, these troops, paramilitary forces, the military, have engaged in a systematic imposition of genocide. What they have been doing in terms, uh, as a result of the arms control, uh, as a result of the Armed Forces Act and other legal uh, means that have been given to them, the legal cover that has been given to them, has been the deliberate violation of human rights, using rape as a, as a means of, as an instrument of policy, of killing innocent people in so-called encounters, in uh, prisons in, in which, which can be called as uh, extrajudicial killings. These taken together violate the Genocide Convention. And this is something that we need to highlight in the international community. Then the third, because of this genocide, the Indian forces have been guilty of war crimes. This kind of treatment of prisoners, the kind of treatment of people taken into custody, even those that are demonstrating on the streets, including children who have been tied to uh, vehicles, military vehicles, and dragged around the streets where uh, shotguns are used in close proximity, in close range, 
to, uh, to shoot at people in their face, to destroy their eyesight, including for children and women and children. These all amount to war crimes. And this is something, again, that the Indian state is guilty of in Kashmir. And then there is, in my view, state-sponsored terrorism against the Kashmiris. We talk a lot about terrorism against states, but not by states against individuals or against a community. And that is precisely what the Indian government has been doing for years in occupied Kashmir. It has unleashed its state terrorism through its agents that are in the pay of the Indian government. The so-called Sarkari milit militants, as they are called, are no, are no one else than paid, hired assassins of the Indian government that have gone around killing innocent people. This genocidal plan uh, is being imposed systematically. Uh, 900,000 troops have been inducted in Kashmir, uh, the densest occupation in the world. Uh, a 24-hour curfew has been imposed. All political prisoners, or all political leaders are in prisons. Uh, thousands of youth have been abducted. Extrajudicial killings uh, have, are being perpetrated. Collective punishments being meted out to Kashmiris. <clears throat> and even uh, young uh, children under the age of four and five have been subjected to pellet guns which have blinded them. Journalists have been accused of, of terrorism. This genocidal plan and the actions of the Indian government in Kashmir uh, has been well recorded uh, by the United Nations, by civil society, by non-governmental organizations, uh, and is well known. These actions are also illegal. These atrocities contravene uh, international humanitarian law, international human rights law, including the Fourth Geneva Convention. They also contravene the Security Council resolutions, which have stated that the final disposition of the state of Jammu and Kashmir will be determined by its people through a free and fair plebiscite held under UN auspices. Today we must concentrate on the people of IOK, the occupied Kashmir. That's our weak link. To keep their hope alive and deeply touch them through other means, which for which some measures are in place, but we need a definite upscaling and visibility of what we do to do this a little more, a little later. I'll tell you, we are in a consistent war with India. There is a need to strengthen our state structure, which is now beginning to take the brunt of this war instead of the uh, kinetic structure that we have. Some policy improvements and also tell our people that there are no quick decisions coming without a very sound basis on which we start our efforts today to reach to some place. So any decisions that the people by and large are expecting are far too away. Luckily, what is on our side, the entire spectrum of leadership, government, opposition, etc., stands united on Kashmir issue. That's our strength. We need to have an ambassador at large for Kashmir as it is in Afghanistan. It will facilitate the foreign office. They're doing a lot of job. They have tremendous pressure. They need to be assisted and not criticized alone. It is about human rights violations and it is about international law, law violations. But perhaps even more important is the fact that the peace in South Asia is hostage to the Kashmir issue. And not just that, all the efforts that the international community are taking to initiate uh, the peace process in Afghanistan and achieve peace on the ground in Afghanistan is also hostage to the situation between India and Pakistan because we have there is no uh, sort of uh, confusion about the fact that uh, India has extended the theater of war.
to the western border and uses that border to destabilize Pakistan. And, and in fact, you see, if you hear their talk shows and some of the seminars that they are having, they actually talk about destabilizing Balochistan. Uh, they talk about destabilizing Karachi and they give the most atrocious ways through which it could be done, where they actually talk about giving money to political parties, giving money to other entities to create unrest. So this is so the theater of war is expanded to Afghanistan. It is used, the land is used against Pakistan. And all of this is hostage to the mindset in India that whatever is happening in Kashmir is perhaps, or how they would want the world to see is that it is instigated by Pakistan. They are creating a new dates for something new, which has not happened in the last many years in this world. So either they have to do some, take some proper decision or either the world has to change these people. If these people will not be changed and these things will be go on, carry on like this, I think it will be a big problem for India also, this Indian people also, Indian community also, because they are in all over the world. So people, they don't like now. We just take the example of New York just yesterday. They have accepted the logo of Kashmir but they didn't accept to do anything about Ram Mandir, what they are going next to Babri Masjid. So this is the, these are the signs that people are not accept, accepting them. So if these things will be run, one day it will be a big problem or a big disaster for whole India. And India is our neighbor also, so it's a big disaster for them. Definitely we will get some bad things also here also. So now the time has come, everybody should wake up, just tell India. Just tell Ms. Modi that this is not the right way what you are doing. Please correct yourself. Let bring some human beings over there. So these people, they just, just focus on the right way, right things, and the things will go more very, very positive. In India, everybody knows that a big community of Muslims over there, they are giving big, big problems for them also. So once they will succeed in Kashmir, the second step is in India. Third step is their neighbor, neighboring countries. So please, everybody should do something now. Start to do something now. If we will not do anything, the day is coming that we will see all over the world big problems, big disasters. And unfortunately, both India and Pakistan are atomic powers now. So if if the things go beyond the limit, then who's responsible? I think both the president's speech, which you will get to see um, in a couple of hours, and uh, the question answers that uh, that the question they proposed to him and the answers uh, that he gave, and each of the speakers uh, really, really went to great lengths and explained the position that we are in, as far as Kashmir is concerned, the position this region is in concern, the dangers that we face, and the necessary steps that we must take. Uh, the, I think the crux of the problem is, and I do take into account Dr. Huma Bakai saying that uh, uh, have uh, strategic restraint, right? But at the same time, I think the uh, uh, I see consensus is to have uh, offensive diplomacy, offensive diplomacy, not um, engaging in conflict, but at least, uh, like uh, General Shakil said, that we can, uh, you know, uh, talk to them, but we must make sure uh, that we, uh, while we talk to them, they must feel that there is strength behind what uh, we talk to them. Otherwise, the Indians are never going to listen to us. That has been proved over 28 years, not only 28 years, but over 38 years, and also really right back uh, to 1947. So I think whereas the right route to go is to engage and talk to each other, but the doors have been shut to us and the red lines that uh, uh, we've been talking about have been crossed so often and uh, so many red lines have been crossed that it has left us with very few options in the meantime. So first of all, let me th thank each speaker, starting with the president of Azad Jammu and Kashmir, he spoke very well, very um, uh, fluently, very 
with, with, with conviction. And then each of the speakers, which included, uh, you know, Dr. Uma Bakai and uh, Ambassador Zameer Akram, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, Minister Anwar Mansoor, and also uh, uh, in the end, Aji Rafiq Abdesi. And uh, yes, we are going to take up uh, the uh, mutation by the uh, President Azad Jammu Kashmir, and we will see as uh, businessmen and industrialists what measures we can take to strengthen uh, Kashmir economically, because it is only through strengthening them economic uh, means that we will give them the wherewithal uh, to, you know, to at least stand up on their feet uh, in, in a better way than uh, than is being done now all throughout uh, Kashmir. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm very grateful to all the participants. I'm very grateful to all those from uh, the Americas who have woken up early in the morning, from um, uh, Asia, East Asia, which at the, at the moment uh, uh, now uh, coming to date evening. So thank you all very much. And with that, I call this webinar to a close. Thank you all.